Welcome to Taking Care of Lady Business, where we put the business back in lady business. Hosted by Jennifer Justice, founder and CEO of the Justice Department, a management strategy and law firm that works with female and woke male entrepreneurs, executives, talent, brands, and creatives to build and maximize their wealth, focusing in the areas of tech, consumer product, finance, media, entertainment, and fashion. Jennifer interviews entrepreneurial women who have done it all, who will be sharing their secrets on all things business, especially as a woman. These highly successful women will share strategies and insights, including what not to do and what it takes to win. And now, here's your host, Jennifer Justice. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. I'm Jennifer Justice. Today, we have Zornitsa Stefanova, and she is the CEO and founder of BSPK, Bespoke is really what it stands for. And she is going to tell us all about what that is and how she got there. She has a very interesting backstory that you're all going to be extremely inspired by. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Hi, um, thank you for uh, for welcoming me to your podcast. It's really an honor and I'm delighted to be here and I'd love to share my story. Um, I love it. So thank you. All right, well, let's get into it then. Let's start by you telling what it is that, you know, what, what the company is now and then we'll get into how you got here. So BSPK is a SaaS platform that enables uh, SaaS means software engagement. as a service. I just want to like software. make sure, and you know what I mean? I, I like, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of terms that are like thrown about and I want people to understand it. Yeah. 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 Software as a service, which really means we provide our service, our software service as a subscription to our customers. Our customers are uh, brands that... Um, look to engage and personalize the experience of their clients, spanning the you know the whole range of anything from uh, personal goods, retail, experiences, uh, wine, hospitality, travel. And why BSPK? Because we make it possible for the sales advisors of these brands and companies to connect and speak with the customer one-on-one -on -one using our software, making the experience feel memorable, uh, the customer uh, experiences being recognized, uh, obtaining great service, having a person to really curate and engage with their needs. And so it really helps brands achieve much stronger loyalty uh, and, and also to grow their business very, very substantially. So that's what BSPK is. We are uh, headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, we also have a French subsidiary in the area in which we work, which includes premium, luxury, hospitality, and travel. Many of the companies we have are uh, European luxury brands. And so for us, it made sense to have a Paris office. And we also now have presence in Hong Kong, uh, again, trying to enable that better customer engagement experience globally uh, across industries. And, and that's sort of our mission to, to do that. I want a Paris office too. <laughs> so give us an example of like a customer experience or any of your clients that you can like illuminate really what exactly BSBK is. So for example, uh, we have um, a customer who uh, is a global brand, uh, Christian Labutin, who is, you know, present in, in, Oh, I think we all know who Christian Labutan is. Yeah. Yeah. Over, <laughs> over, over 100 countries. Many of us are customers. I love Christian Labutan. Beautiful, beautiful brands, uh, brand with beautiful handbags, shoes. I mean, we, we all know it. And uh, we were really grateful and thankful to them because they were our first large customer. We learned a lot in the process with them and how they use BSPK is that is deployed across uh, all of their stores. Their sales advisors use BSPK to uh, get to know the client, uh, to be reminded to reach out and connect with the client at the right time. And it's not sort of the, the megaphone marketing that all of us are tired of. And we all, as customers of, uh, you know, of course know how oversaturated our experiences with being, you know, broadcasted to, marketed to, no one wants that. Right. But the personalization that we have enabled with Christian Louboutin is that they recognize the individual customer, they get to know them over time. And so 
when they reach out and connect and try to bring that customer back into the experience, into the brand fold, into the store, uh, it's accomplished in a way that feels human. So a sales advisor may uh, use BSBK to curate an idea for a customer they know. You know, Zernitza likes, you know, beautiful structured bag with the sneakers, with the spikes. They curate that idea to send it to me, the customer Zernitza. I see that and I know the person who sent it to me because it's my sales advisor. Mm -hmm. So that really leads to me saying, oh, I love this. And then you go back to the store or buy remotely. And so creates that one-on-one -on -one connection that in this day and age, in the age of e-commerce is very, very difficult for brands to accomplish. Um, so that's how they use this. And it's really a daily tool uh, for the salespeople. Uh, we also have other examples. We have uh, a male focused brand that is uh, tailoring suits and it's all custom and it's all very sort of pick your fabric, pick your buttons, pick your pockets. And so again, they curate the look for the customer based on what they know about the customer from prior interactions. They message that to the customer. The customer has a private idea book where they can preview everything that's been offered to them by their sales advisor. They make their choices. They communicate back and forth, maybe go back to the showroom right. and go from there. So that's right. how- So it's not like when I get like, hey, um, I saw you looking at this thing on net a -Porte. like come, you know, you, did you leave something? It's like much more. And it's not like so general, like there's a sale. It's like more tailored toward an individual. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. So how tailored, did you know this yeah. needed to be solved? <laughs> because I'm the customer. <laughs> So I was inspired uh, from a very, very uh, memorable and, and, and to this day cherished uh, shopping experience. I was on a business trip with my prior company in Las Vegas, had a few hours to kill before my flight. And I walked into the Crystals Mall, uh, you know, one of the best malls in uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, I just happened to walk into Roberto Cavalli, which is a brand I'd never shopped. I knew about them, but kind of didn't know them. I walked in and I, I met a very nice sales advisor. He truly spoiled me, showed me this, that, and the other, this dress, you know, shoes, whatever. And I fell in love with the dress. It was a very expensive piece, a runway piece. I tried it on, I loved it. He took pictures of me and at the end, uh, I was like, you know, Bobby, I gotta think about this. So I left without buying, uh, which of course is the last thing a salesperson wants to experience. Exactly. But long story short, the next morning, he sent me a very nice text message with a picture of me wearing the dress saying, hey, you look gorgeous, no pressure, but if you change your mind, I'm saving it for you. And, and of course, I changed my mind two days later. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to get a dress. So I bought it. Um, everything was taken care of. They learned it, shipped it, you know, whatever they needed to do. Um, and to this day, it's one of my favorite pieces. And I... After the shopping experience, I thought, oh my God, that, that was awesome. Like, why doesn't everybody do this? So I got back on the plane, uh, went to Vegas, met with that salesperson, asked them how they do their job. Uh, I then spoke with the store manager. I met the other salespeople. And what I heard was we would love to do this for all of our customers, but we don't have the tools. We don't have the pictures handy. We try to personalize from our own personal phones. And it's hard. What really is, you know, got me is that they had like some colleague in the Miami store always wore these dresses so well. They asked her to put them on so that she can take a picture, share it with the team so the right. team can share it with customers, right? Hard, lots of work. And I repeated that kind of research across multiple brands. I went to La Perla. I went to uh, Cartier. Uh, and then I, you know, Cop Coupine, uh, uh, one of our early customers who is a much smaller brand, nothing like Cartier, nothing like, you know, uh, Roberto Cavalli, much lower price point. And the message was the same, that when you personalize the experience for the client, they feel recognized and cherished and taken care of, they come back and that it really is where the business has an opportunity to evolve. And so that inspired me. And then from a business point of view, this type of engagement has been happening for a long time by brands. Every brand has their top 10 customers. But how do you go from the top 10 to the top 1,000 to the top 20,000? Right, because it, right now, it was all being operated with manpower, woman power. Yes. And yes. it was uh, yes. very labor intensive. And how can you yeah. make this much quicker, yeah. faster experience? Yeah. It sounds so like that's a lot of very expensive yeah. research, though, that you were doing. 
No, really? <laughs> like no, buying really? a Cartier A? <laughs> buying a Roberto Cavalli? Oh, that, yes. <laughs> that was expensive. That was expensive for sure. But going to the store and speaking with people and engaging one-on-one with a salesperson to say, hey, what's hard today in your job? That actually was easy research because when you ask people, what is it that you want to do or be, or how do you want to do your job and what's hard today? They're, they can sit there for hours telling you. And so that, that was invaluable research for me to be able to build this product and realize one thing, if it's easy to use, it will be used. If it's hard to use the way much, you know, many software tools fail because they're hard to use, yeah. it will not have an impact. Yeah, it's so true. Like if I can't turn it on and it works, I'm pissed. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? right. you know what I mean? It's like that's this right. is yeah. not my job to figure this out. Like, make it easy yeah. for me. This is your yeah. job to make it easy for me, yeah. right? Not you personally, yeah. but um. And so, what what were you doing before? How did you have this experience? I mean, I love the fact that you were super curious. You went to this one experience, and you're like, "How do you make this easy for everybody?" Well, what were you doing before? I have been in tech uh, my entire career. Before I, uh, before BSPK, I ran product at uh, a number of venture-backed startup companies in the San Francisco Bay Area. So my background truly is sort of the entrepreneurship, early stage, uh, building from ground, from the ground up. Uh, and I built products in music streaming, uh, in social media, in uh, fintech in uh in uh, media streaming so across the spectrum of the consumer experience i was able to at different stages of my career learn how to develop a product that people actually want to use and actually it's benefited bspk because the way we approached bspk was with that background in meaning that i had done so many consumer facing products not b2b that when we now started, when I started BSPK and we went out to build the business to business product because we sell to companies, that's what I mean by business to business. Yeah. I was able to take that approach of how do you build software for consumers that has to be so easy that there's no training required. Mm -hmm. And so I took that experience from all these, you know, previously consumer focused companies. Uh, I mean, you know, a company that was bought by MySpace, uh, Six Apart which was bought by New Media, uh, e-groups, which was bought by Yahoo, Wired, Hotwired, which, you know, we all know we see that on the bookshelves and had a digital division where, you know, it has, has the print publishing for consumers. So all of these experiences together led me to believe that if we built a product for our current customers that is as easy to use as Instagram, WhatsApp, messages, that's going to be successful because that's what that is the alternative for our current end users. So, so that's my background. Uh, it really is sort of innovation, thinking about what makes people engage with the product. I also work very closely with engineers, with product teams. Um, I've led product teams. And so I know what it takes to build something. Uh, and that has really informed us ability to our ability to bring in the right features and get them done quickly and, and get the company off the ground. And so, but is this the first company that you started on your own? No, it's not the first company. I had another company shortly uh, in 2000, shortly after the dot-com bust, worst possible time to start a company. <laughs> and that company was called Ruby Networks. And uh, our mission was to create a live interface for mobile phones. So, you know, back in the day, a mobile phone was based on something called WAP. It was all text-based, you know, blue, you know, the Blackberries, you know, th those kinds of phones where you couldn't tap and drag and, you know, do all the things we do on our I iPhones and Androids today. And we wanted to actually have the iPhone. We wanted to have that live interface where you could move and drag and drop things. And so that was the mission of Ruby Networks. We built software to enable that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, we couldn't make it succeed because it was the worst possible time to raise capital. We had a terrible time raising capital. Customers weren't buying, you know, the whole, the whole tech scene was frozen. And then I had another company 10 years later called SpotMe, which was a payments app uh, where it was possible to track expenses with friends and roommates. And, and that was very successful. It was one of the top rated apps. It was a you know, competitor of Venmo and and other apps. And I, you know, um, I pursued that for, 
a few yeah. years, uh, but it took me in a different direction where that business grew to become a consulting company. So I ran that company for seven years. And uh, later after that, uh, I decided that again, I wanted to get back to building products. And so I shifted to starting DSPK and raising capital for it. Okay. So you went from your own company to this, another, this company and yes. to this. Yeah. Okay. So when did yes. you start uh, BSBK? We started BSBK in 2018. Okay. So we're about to celebrate our fifth, fifth year. We'll be five. <laughs> our Amazing. fifth birthday is coming up. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time. So you've been in tech your whole career here but let's go a little bit back further like where you're from i know that that's we won't spend that much time on it but you know it's pretty extraordinary where you came from and then you're here now so tell us a little bit about where you were born and how you got here yeah i was born and raised in bulgaria um at a time when it was a communist satellite of the soviet union this is before the you know iron curtain fell and the world changed uh, I was 17 when I left. I left alone. I defected. I really wanted a different life. I felt very strongly about being free and you know being able to say what I wanted to say and living the way I want to live. And and so I defected. I went to West Germany, um, Munich. Applied for asylum. Uh, my dream was to come to America, and that took two years to get that. Uh, you know, asylum, which ultimately was granted to me. Uh, well, granted, this kind of was granted. It sounds grandiose, but I asked for it, and I was able to win and, and gain that um, access. I came to California in two thousand. Uh, excuse me, nineteen eighty nine or eighty eight. Sorry, <laughs> and I was just about shy of twenty. Uh, didn't know how things work at all, where to go, what to do. I had a host family for about a month through a refugee organization, which helped me get here and called International Rescue Committee, to whom I'm very, very grateful for what they do, even to this day. And uh, yeah, I came to California, found a, a job, um, went to first community college for a year, then applied and transferred to Stanford, graduated from Stanford with a degree in international relations, uh, began my career in tech and uh, 10 years into my career, I decided to also go to business school. So I went to Wharton to study finance and I have an MBA in finance. So that was my path. You know, I just uh, really felt that, um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's pretty amazing it's how it can yeah, pursue. It's an amazing story. <laughs> pursue, and here pursue. you are like a third time female founder you know, this, obviously you raised VC money, you know, you kind of came here by yourself and look, I mean, you wanted to come here to, you know, the land of what the quote unquote free, obviously, you know, for women, it has not really felt like that. I mean, definitely not my entire life. And it feels even worse now after Roe, it's like, you know, you must have experienced all the other sexism, misogyny, et cetera, as women, especially in Silicon Valley, especially the era you were going at, you know, growing up in tech, like, what was that like? Yeah, so it's a really fantastic question, also a difficult question, um, because on the one hand, I truly feel so strongly that this country is a country where you can do things, like the ones I've been able to do, where I feel grateful for the opportunity yeah. that I can come from nowhere, <laughs> build a career in tech, go to community college, then go to Stanford, right? Those kinds of transitions are very, very difficult to this day in most other countries, including yeah. Western Europe, which is also free. this conversation yeah. with somebody right? today. Yeah. And if anybody is seeing the Tetris <laughs> movie, like that was insane. I just watched that yeah. one. That was crazy. Yeah. yeah. So that on the one hand, on the other hand, I could not agree more that very kind of paradoxical, you know, a big paradox in my head where that I'm trying to reconcile that Yes, you know, for women, it's a lot harder here, a lot harder. And I remember the moment when I first came here. I mean, I, you know, I've always been outspoken, always very confident, you know, never before I came to, to this country, I never thought about myself as like, oh, I'm different. You know, I can't be like the, the men and the male counterparts. And and I remember shortly after I graduated, a distinct moment, I thought, hmm, that's weird. Why am I being talked down to all the time? Right. Yeah. I am not used to this. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I do think there is tremendous amount of change that needs to happen 
and I have two daughters that are 16 and 19 and hope that there is the generational change that's coming. Uh, not if, I can't say for sure if that's the case, of course, but but I do think that the opportunity for women is limited. It's hard to raise capital. I mean, I, I've been fortunate to have the support of, uh, you know, many people from work, in fact, to be able to raise capital. But it's the questions, the, the doubts, the sort of difficulty to convince an investor to bet on you as a female founder are daunting. Mm-hmm. And they're much, much the barrier. You have to prove that that you're... You know, you have to prove yourself before you have a chance to prove yourself in a way. And so it's it's a very different standard that's applied. I've had also many professional experiences where I wasn't taken seriously. I was told to my face that I'm not being taken seriously because of who I am. But even and, though you went to Stanford and Wharton. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's it, so it, insane. It, yeah, it, it does happen. Now, there are also the opposite example, right? I mean, there are examples where my career have been supported by men and they've been, you know, some of my best supporters and mentors, but the path to success is truly a different standard. I mean, that you know, you have people who are much less qualified, less experienced, and, you know, they kind of just get a, 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 free, a free pass occasionally. And I think the occasional free pass, when you have five or 10 of those, they add up. And so when you look at the career progression, Uh, of women the other thing I have to say that's such a great point that I want to say like you said you know they get a one or two get a free pass but then five to ten they add up to a bunch of free passes which is a bunch of mediocrity being and not you know there's many many like you said there's many amazing men I had many amazing male mentors but after a while when you're like, okay, you're watching a bunch of them or pass you up when you know that you have the exact, you know, you have the same, if not better skill sets. It also, you know, it not only pushes the women down, but it also like it weighs on your psyche. It's like, it's exhausting. You're just like, why am I fighting anymore? You know? Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, the more women there are in a position to make a change and be vocal and clear about it. I get personally uh, very profoundly annoyed when I hear the, the argument like, yeah, I know because motherhood gets in the way. Let me tell you, the women who want to be successful, motherhood is a piece of cake. Yeah. You know, when you have decided you want to be professionally successful, you have a mission, you have a vision, it's part of life. And those women have already figured out how they're going to deal with the motherhood and they're eager to come back. Yeah. I have one of those women working for me. Yeah. I mean, she had a babe, like take the time off, you know, she got back to work a month later and she's like on fire getting stuff done. And so I think that argument of like, yeah, because you know, motherhood, yeah, of course, many women make a choice to stay at home because they want to be with their kids. Fine. That's a personal choice. But for those who choose to pursue a career and want to stay in the career, guess what? The person who earns less in the family, it's a logical choice for any family. They're going to stay at home. And so if men are paid more and there has to be a trade of who's going to stay home with the kids, the woman is paid less, she's going to stay at home. doesn't matter at which level of education, what career path, what. So to me, it's not about money. It's about equal pay, equal opportunity, yeah. respect. That's how you get women to stay and be part of the workforce and contribute in society, which is a huge loss if they don't. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's one thing. It's like after you have a baby, right? We all know, you know, that it's obviously physically draining and, you know, getting the baby, you know, to stay alive, et cetera. Right. Okay. After all those things and maternity leave and postpartum depression, if you have that, once all that's kind of stable, right. It shouldn't be motherhood. It's like parenthood. Okay. Like, so parenthood should be hard on both of us, like the male and like, I happen to have my kids by myself. So it's like, you know, it's hard on me on both sides, but, um, you know, it shouldn't be just motherhood. It's hard. Fatherhood should be hard too. If it's not, then they're not doing it right. You know, because it's hard to be a parent. It really is hard to be a parent. And so if we're saying just motherhood is hard, no, it should be parenthood is hard. And if Mm -hmm. that's the conversation, then the conversation needs to change into parenthood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just hope that there's more. And, you know, with BSPK and what I do now, 
my mission is to create a really successful, really successful, really visible company, not just for our customers, not just for our end users and their clients, but also as an example of of what's possible and is an you know an opportunity to to show yeah you know as, as female entrepreneurs we can build success and and I think the more of those successes we have what is my company or other women's company the the easier it becomes to be able to walk into a VC pitch and give your pitch and not and know that you're not being questioned just because of who you are but it's really on the merits of the business and the opportunity and the idea. I don't think that's quite the case yet. It, it really is not. Right. Uh, there is a very, very strong bias, certainly in tech. And, you know, we I read about it. I don't know it firsthand, but like, and I mean, media, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. There's a double standard. And I, I would like that double standard to, to contribute to that being addressed um, so that professional careers, in addition to happy personal lives, hopefully. Right. Right. So, I mean, yeah. So how do you think that's going to happen? I mean, what are ways that you think that we can change that double standard? Equal pay, number one, period. Right. Um, more opportunities for mothers who can't afford three babysitters to have their children taken care of properly. So investment in education yeah. and early early childhood, critical because that's what, what's critical for, for young families. Uh, but equal pay, uh, honest conversation, uh, more authentic conversation, and more women in power. I think there are many women who want to help. They're just not able to help because they don't have the position of power to do so. Well, isn't you know, it? Really, it's kind of, I mean, men should yeah. be helping, right? <laughs> yeah, that too. And I think there, it's increasingly happening. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, yes and no. I just don't know. Uh, so there are examples, uh, you know, I see them daily where it's like, hmm, you know, even when I think about some of the decision makers in, in the business where we are, yeah, it's it's mostly men. So we got to go convince a bunch of men that, you know. <laughs> right. So, yeah, right. so, so, so ra- yeah, I know you raised VC money for this. And it, like, did you raise mostly from men or all men? All men. Yeah. And did you try to raise from women as well? I did. And I have to say, to my disappointment, that the men invested, the women did not. Yeah. I mean, I think that that has come across. There's, you know, a woman, Sarah Lacey, who was on this podcast, and she had great things to, you know, she had a great viewpoint about like, look, if women are VCs and they're raising LPs and they need to make sure that they are, you know, actually you know getting returns for them um they have a lot of pressure to do what most people have done and that's and in, that's invested men unfortunately you know yeah so it's tough so you know i know that we have to let you go very soon but let me ask you you know what do you think you have done that made you succeed in raising this money from men so other women who are listening can can understand or learn from that i persevered so I don't take no as, you know, as, as the reason to give up. Right. I stay true to my message and my vision and what I wanted to do. I'm also pretty direct. Yeah. Uh, meaning that, you know, if people ask questions, I answer them. If they don't ask questions, I don't answer them. But when I answer them, I say what exactly what's on my mind. Right. So perhaps, if they don't ask questions, I don't answer them. <laughs> yeah, and, and perhaps, perhaps that conveyed a sense of uh, trust. I also engaged, I have to say that uh, my network and the friendships I built in business school were very helpful um, because many of uh, my first investor was uh, the Dean of Entrepreneurship at, at Wharton. And he led and, you know, being able to, to say, I have this person on my board, uh, mm-hmm. on my, as my investor, not on my board, but as an investor, essentially you have to build step-by-step. Step. You have to step, connect the dots between who else is in the round and why they should trust you. And of course, you have to be clear in your vision and your passion and build that trust with investors. I don't know if that's helpful, because it, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's how you raise money as a woman compared to how to you, you raise money as, as a male founder. It's easy as a, as a male founder. I know that. But it's more like 
we have to put that. I really feel that if we all women put that behind us, am I a woman or not? And just went in and said, this is it. This is why I'm here. This is what I want. This is how I'm going to get there. All that self-doubt and self get that goes with, I am going to be, you know, a second class citizen again. I think it tends to diminish. And I think that's helpful. And I think it helps advance. No, I, look, I think going in with conviction, understanding you deserve it just as much as everybody else is extremely helpful. It's just, you know, you need to hear that over and over again. <laughs> like we talked about earlier, it's like exhausting. Sometimes I just like, can I just like lay on my bed and watch Netflix all day? You know what I mean? I know but- it's not getting me anywhere, but sometimes it's like very tough. <laughs> If you're just like beaten, beaten down over and over and over again. The most frequent advice I give to my girls is never doubt yourself. Yes, exactly. Don't, don't question yourself. Right. Even I like it or not know. like it, but yeah. you don't question. Yeah. 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 And I think yeah, more of that. Well, um, okay. We've come to the end now, but there is one thing that I always ask everybody, and I'm sure you've gotten a lot of it, given your background. What is the worst advice you've ever received? <laughs> I don't know about ever, but a uh, worst advice I remember in the context of BSPK is after I raised uh, our seed, seed, uh, somebody said to me, oh, you know, now they raise money, go spend it, spend it. You have to spend it because if you spend it, you're going to show that you're investing. That's why investors give you money and, you know, they're going to give you more. And I was like, hmm, I don't know, like, it doesn't sound like sound business advice to me. And thankfully, we did not pursue that advice. Uh, and I continue to be very vicious with how we spend our money, how we invest our money, where do we spend it? Because let me tell you, in a startup, there's so many unknowns. There's so many. I'm amazed to this day. I've been in startups for 25 years. I'm still learning new things all the time, new lessons, one after another. And uh, yeah, I can go on and on. But basically, that advice of, oh, now that you have money, you spend it. Yeah, it's it's something that's often repeated around Silicon Valley. But I I'm glad I didn't follow that advice. And I wouldn't advise any entrepreneur to follow that advice. Right. Well, amazing. I mean, I think anybody would take any of your advice one way or another, given your history and such an inspiration. I'm so glad my audience got to know who you are. If people want to find you and your company, how do they do that? Uh, Our company is at bspk.com and I am on LinkedIn. Um, Zornitsa Stefanova, if you look me up, I doubt there are many, <laughs> many other. Uh, I doubt so. Many other Zornitsa Stefanova. Yeah. There are some, but yeah, but not. Yeah, you'll find me. Or mm-hmm. also Zornitsa at bspk.com. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for t- sharing your story. Such an inspiration. Thank you all you're doing to trailblaze for female founders as well. So everyone, thank you for listening to this episode of Taking Care of Lady Business. Until next time, I'm Jennifer Justice.